This is the polycarbonate lecture. Uh, there will be two polycarbonate lectures, so this is the first half of the two polycarbonate lectures for thermoplastic resins. Polycarbonate has some unique characteristics, and these include dimensional stability, hardness, ductility or flexibility, heat resistance, and clarity. We talked about nylons before, uh, and these tend to be milky or uh, translucent. Uh, polycarbonates are strong, flexible, and clear. When it comes to polycarbonates, uh, these were first developed uh, uh, in the late 1890s, and this was created by reacting resorcinol and hydroquinone and phosgene in a pyridine solvent. This produced a very cr uh, crystalline polycarbonate resin, which was difficult to process and very brittle, so not terribly useful. We fast forward to 1941, and that's where we get the first commercially available polycarbonate resin uh, produced by PPG Aerospace Transparencies. And PPG Aerospace Transparencies are currently the leading manufacturer of uh, polymers for glazing applications. In other words, windows, windshields, blast barriers, canopies, specialty transparencies for aerospace applications. Uh, Crosslink polycarbonate resin can also be prepared by peroxide-initiated radical polymerization of bisallyl carbonate and diethylene glycol. And this produces a colorless, transparent thermoplastic. In the 1950s, uh, the current polycarbonate technology was developed. So this is by Bayer and GE separately developed uh, the process based on bisphenol A. Uh, this was reacted to produce uh, diphenyl carbonate by reacting with phosgene. Then diphenyl carbonate was reacted with bisphenol A to produce polymer. Uh, this, produce, this approach produced slow reaction rates and, need, and the need for several small-scale batch reactors. What we try to do in modern um, polymer production is to do continuous reaction, and rather uh, as opposed to batch reaction. So um, uh, this was not ideal. In 1953, uh, polycarbonate resin was attributed to GE polymers, which is now under the heading of SABIC, and this produced a new wire insulation material. When it comes to the major global polycarbonate producers, this is 5.4 billion pounds per year. Uh, Bayer Material Science does about 30% and SABIC does about 27%. Uh, Bayer produces uh, Macrolon or Merlon and SABIC produces Lexan. Um, other companies also produce their own like Panlite or Calibre, uh, but the primarily we're looking at, at Bayer and uh, SABIC. There are two major methods to produce polycarbonate. There's a two-phase interfacial polycondensation polymerization, and then there's a melt transesterification. The first one I will talk about uses phosgene and bisphenol A, and the melt transesterification uses diphenyl carbonate and bisphenol A. So bisphenol A is kind of a workhorse not only in thermoplastics, but also in thermosets. This is our friend bisphenol A. So if you, that is something you should probably know the structure of. And then this is reacted with phosgene to produce polycarbonate. This is done by two-phase interfacial polycondensation polymerization. This yields a high purity polycarbonate product. This can be done by either batch or continuous uh, polymerization, and it's usually done at 30 degrees Celsius to 42 degrees Celsius. So what do I mean by a two-phase interfacial polycondensation? Well, first, you have to take your bisphenol A and treat it to make it water soluble. Bisphenol A itself is not water soluble, but if you react it with sodium hydroxide, which is our friend here, you get a sodium salt of bisphenol A. So this particular species is water soluble. Then you take your sodium salt of bisphenol A and that goes into the aqueous phase of a two-phase interfacial condensation reaction. Your phosgene, which is shown here, uh, goes into an organic phase, which is the methylene chloride solvent. And what you actually get is a reaction that occurs at the interface in between those two solvents. Now if you've ever mixed oil with water, the interface is the spot in between where they do not mix. It's where the oil meets the water. And so this is a similar concept here. But here we have a polymerization reaction occurring at that interface. Uh, so the sodium salt of BPA reacts with phosgene and that yields polycarbonate at the interface. What does this mean logically? This is all wonderful. I've shown you all these great chemical reactions, which for me, a chemist, is, is wonderful. But what does this mean to you as a student? What is actually happening? Cue the cartoon your interfacial reaction cartoon. So here we have the organic layer uh, and you have your phosgene in the methylene chloride solvent. Here you have your aqueous layer and here is your uh, sodium salt of bisphenol A. There's also a little bit of sodium hydroxide here. And then this reacts at this interface to produce the polycarbonate at this interface. 
and then you have a little bit of sodium chloride that is produced as a byproduct of that reaction. So that was interfacial condensation. This is melt transesterification of diphenyl carbonate, which is this puppy here, diphenyl carbonate, and bisphenol A. Now, this doesn't use phosgene, and that's considered a plus. Phosgene is very nasty. It, is, it, was, it has been used in chemical warfare uh, to burn and, and harm people significantly. So phosgene, getting away, and that can be a concern when you're handling phosgene as well from a safety perspective. So getting away from the use of phosgene um, is, is not necessarily a bad thing. This is also known as the non-phosgene process for that reason, because it uses diphenyl carbonate instead of phosgene. So in this case, you take di bisphenol A and diphenyl carbonate to produce the same polycarbonate repeat unit. Um, it has sh there's a lot of interest shifted to this method because it uh, moves away from the use of phosgene, which as I mentioned is nasty, and methylene chloride. Handling methylene chloride as a solvent, you have to, it's expensive. Um, it can be detrimental to the environment, so you have to recycle it for both of those reasons, so it doesn't go out into the environment. And um, so this melt transesterification has become, uh, is gaining some ground. When it comes to polycarbonate, you usually have polymer that has a molecular weight of 22,000 to 35,000. Uh, typically the mean unit weight is 254, therefore you have a repeat unit being from 87 to 138. It has a TG of 145 to 150. Uh, it has very low crystallinity, but it is there. Uh, and so you do have some crystalline melting at 230 degrees Celsius. It's considered relatively amorphous. It has very, very low crystallinity. And for that reason, it has excellent clarity. You get light transmission of about 87 to 91 percent, and it has a, a refractive index which is similar to glass. One of the things about polycarbonate uh, is due to its macromolecular structure. You have these bulk aromatic benzene rings, so shown here, that come from bisphenol A and are in the polymer backbone. Uh, that drives the TG up. So, um, so when I'm looking at the TG, so this TG, uh, when we don't have anything in the background, hangs out around, you know, if you have something like nylon, say, uh, it's around 50. You put aromatic groups in the backbone and it raises that TG significantly. It makes the molecules themselves very rigid. And I'm going the wrong way. Okay, uh, and then you have these methyl groups that are on the carbon atoms between these two, and they act like a wedge. And so between the rigidity of the, uh, of the uh, backbone and this wedge, it makes it really difficult for chains to slip past each other. And what that re uh, uh, results in is a, is a polymer that can absorb energy rather, rather than shatter. And that makes it really, really beneficial for bullet-resistant glass. This has very high ductility, it's very flexible. That also helps with the bullet resistant nature. This can be sawed, drilled, or nailed without cracking the polymer and without crack clogging machinery. It's also physiologically inert, so you can use polycarbonate for medical applications, uh, and it has FDA approval. It's very good heat resistance, uh, so if you're in an application where heat is a, is a concern, that's good. It's, it has a good heat resistance, so it's more difficult to process, but uh, the softening point is very high and it can be stable at temp temperatures ranging from minus 170 degrees Celsius to 126 degrees Celsius. Its heat deflection temperature is 132, and its critical use temperature is 126. So in other words, you can hit 126 uh, uh, every now and then, uh, but you don't want to get higher than that because you'll start to soften. Polycarbonate has very good, excellent dimensional stability and very high creep resistance because of the rigidity of that molecule and the tendency for chains not to slip past each other because of those methyl wedges. Uh, it has impressive com um, compression strength. Uh, it has 110 elongation, so it doesn't elongate the same way that nylon does, um, but is more similar to polypropylene. And it has a uh, very good coefficient of linear expansion. It's better in the glass-filled poly uh, polycarbonate versus unfilled. This is, again, a self-extinguishing polymer. Uh, so we sh again, I'm showing the oxygen index here. So once again, oxygen content in air. Uh, this actually should be 22, not 28. Uh, we have uh, nylon 6.6, and then we have polycarbonate, which is more self-extinguishing. The vapor itself, if it does actually burn, produces carbon dioxide and water if, it's in, if you force incineration of this. So the vapor is environmentally safe. You're not going to get super nasty dioxin and things from this. You're just going to get carbon dioxide and water. This has limited weathering resistance, uh, so you do need to use UV light stabilization for outdoor applications. And the reason for that is those aromatic rings in the backbone. Uh, those tend to 
enhance weathering. It's the same reason uh, that polystyrene weathers. So uh, this can be attacked by mineral oil, uh, and you can use chlorinated solvents to solvent weld this, which means that it can be attacked and dissolved by chlorinated solvents. This has excellent electrical insulating properties. Um, not significantly better than some of the lower cost uh, polymers, but if you need the other properties of polycarbonate, it has excellent uh, electrical insulating properties. Some of the problems are it yellows, and it yellows because of those aromatic rings in the backbone. Uh, those are just a perfect target for free radicals that are present in the atmosphere, and those can attack those rings and can cause chain scission events. So what's a chain scission event? It breaks the polymer chain. In other words, you get lower molecular weight. And as we all know, thermoplastics get their strength from molecular uh, high molecular weight. Uh, it does have limited chemical resistance. It can be hydrolyzed by alkali and attacked by strong acids. And detergents and chlorinated solvents can attack polycarbonate. Now you can use chlorinated solvents to solvent weld, and when you're solvent welding, really all you're doing is dissolving the surface a little bit. So if, you, if this is soaked in chlorinated solvents, you're just going to dissolve the polycarbonate. Another big problem with polycarbonate is that it's hydroscopic. It will have about 0.35% equilibrium moisture at ambient conditions. You're like, wow, that's really low, who cares? Well, 0.35 is enough to cause contamination such, such that you cannot predict the properties in your final product. So you have to get rid of that moisture. Moisture acts as a plasticizer. And unless you want plasticizer present, plasticizers reduce your, your mechanical properties. So, and you always want, if, if there's something present in there, you always want to know how much and what the, what the outcome is going to be on your final product. So, in this case, moisture is bad, we want it gone. So it will reduce the impact strength if it's present. So, you want to uh, dry your material uh, and make sure that it is, and make sure you use that immediately after you've dried it. You want to do that at 120 to 125 for about four hours. Um, and you want to keep the moisture levels low uh, whenever you're using it. Uh, polycarbonate can be melt processed with all commonly used processes for thermoplastic. The only issue with this is that it has a high processing temperature and a high melt viscosity. So you're looking at uh, 280 to 350 degrees Celsius for injection molding and extrusion based processes. So this can be daunting and uh, can be a challenge to processing, but it is an engineering thermoplastic that has a very high TG, so this is to be expected. Now we see this little stop sign, which means this is where I'm going to conclude the first half of the polycarbonate lecture, and I'll pick it up in the second half.